The lesson in mythology that we have this time is one that is not found in the book of Edith Hamilton. However, this story still comes out to be one of the many popular mythological stories. Not just a mythological story, but one that has left a good impact in the field of literature. In so many accounts of world literature, this selection can be found there. So we have the story of Daedalus and Icarus. Paired with that is the literature lesson on knowing facts and opinions, or establishing a fact, pointing out the fact, and differentiating it from an opinion. Let's start with that, facts versus opinions. When we give out statements, it's a matter of whether these statements that we give are subjective in nature or objective in a sense. When we provide a statement, an expression, or any claim which is personally provided to the point that it is subjective, it could vary from how one person sees it and how another person looks at the statement, more or less what we have provided is an opinion. No matter how good our support is, if it's a statement where another person could stand against to the point that no verified support can stand as a backup to that statement, it comes out as an opinion. Please be reminded of that. If no verified clay, if no verified support comes out as a backup to that statement, it comes out, that statement comes out as an opinion. How do we know that a support is a verified one? One possible criterion that we could, we could consider is the possibility that that support is generally accepted, wild, widely accepted. Meaning, if it is introduced to many and so many have considered it to be acceptable, then it can come out as a verified support. That's what, con that's what makes the statement a fact. For example, if someone says, the sun rises in the east, a statement of this sort, right? Okay, again, we have the statement, the sun rises in the east. A statement of this sort is already verified and it's proven in science. And so it's a statement that is introduced to many. The support is known to many. The, the support is indeed well verified. Thus, the statement that goes, the sun rises in the east, comes out as a fact. Compared to when someone says, the sun is a beautiful, a beautiful celestial body. The word beautiful is one in the first place that has no evidentiary quantification. Like what is one's gauge for an object, for a celestial body at that, to be considered beautiful? Unfortunately, we don't have a common understanding of what makes a celestial body beautiful. Jacob may say, to me, a celestial body is beautiful because... It shines bright. Then comes Kent. A celestial body is beautiful because it is very tiny. It's very cute. Then Jade may say, no celestial body is beautiful at all. Jamie may say, all other celestial bodies are beautiful except for the sun. King may say, to me, only the rings of planets come out as beautiful. No star is beautiful to me. So there is already a difference in how the word beautiful is seen by different people as attributed to a celestial body. That makes the issue, that makes the statement not easily verified. Because in the first place, no common gauge comes out as introduced to many, understood by many, that proves the validity of one's claim, making it supposedly a fact. Thus, the statement, the sun is beautiful, is just an opinion. If someone, though, would say, the sun is hot, that is a different case. To say that the sun is hot, you need to, to have it backed up with support. And do we have some support to back it up? Does science provide 
a good deal of support to, to support to establish the idea that the sun is indeed hot? It does. And so the statement, the sun is hot, is acceptable, it is a fact, and not an opinion. If one of you would say or would create a statement that goes, um, Jason is a great hero. Remember for the, from the story of the Quest of the Golden Fleece? One of you might say, Jason is a great hero. Does everybody have the common understanding and do, does everybody accept that common understanding of what a great hero is as you attribute it to Jason? Does Chelsea think of Jason in the same way? Does Corinne agree with that statement? Or does Natalia find it rather false? Because there is a backstory that we know of Jason, and maybe that backstory is what rather drives you into thinking that Jason in the quest of the Golden Fleece, or Jason as the member of the Argonauts, is not a great hero at all. So how that statement is or how that statement is supposed to mean is then perceived differently by people. And again, there's nothing verified and all the more introduced to many that supports that statement to come out as a factual one. Thus, the statement, Jason is a great hero, comes out as an opinion. Compared to Jason and his men are referred to as the Argonauts. That statement is not anymore an opinion. That is not just an opinion. Do we have a support for this? Is there an account that is generally introduced to many that to, to the point that people don't even have to debate about it? There's no need to argue about it because the support is one that is truthful. The support comes out as one that is acceptable on its own. Going back to the statement, Jason and his men are referred to as the Argonauts. What support do we get from it to make that to establish the factuality of that statement? We trace it back to the story. Jason and his men were in a ship. The ship is named the Argo. And so that, that ship is the root, the root word from where we have created a term to stand for the men of Jason and him in that same ship. And so we have the term Argonauts. Thus, the statement, Jason and his men are referred to as the Argonauts, is indeed a fact, not an opinion. Let's involve other mythological names. Zeus is loyal to Hera. Oh, no, let's not use Zeus is loyal to Hera. Let's look at it based on how several accounts prove Zeus to be. Zeus is not loyal to Hera. Opinion or a fact? Try to evaluate. Zeus is not loyal to Hera. Is that an opinion or is that rather a fact? I'd like to ask Kid. I would say that it's a fact because in the story, there were many instances where Zeus um, um, came into the form of a human in order to, to mate with the human, sir. Correct. Here's what I'd like everybody to keep in mind. Just because an adjective comes out in a statement doesn't mean that it becomes an opinion. We need to consider, do we have substantial support, verified support that could say that this statement is not anymore an opinion, rather it now becomes a fact. And Kent has pointed out the issue. The words, the words not loyal may lean into becoming an opinion. Like when you use a state, uh, the words not loyal in a sentence, one may feel like the statement is not, an op is not factual. It's rather opinionated. However, we look at supports. Do, does mythology, do the stories in mythology present a good substance to speak of the infidelity or disloyalty of Zeus? Yes. 
Several accounts indeed show that Zeus have become disloyal, infidel to Hera to think that Hera was supposedly his wife, his queen. In fact, so I, I pointed it out in our initial discussions in mythology, so many mortals, so many demigods have come out to be uh, offshoots or, or targets of Hera's anger because of the relationship that Zeus had with mortal women. And that is, the, like what Keith has pointed out, that is a clear proof that Zeus is indeed not loyal. The statement, the, the statement therefore, Zeus is not loyal to Hera, is, com is coming out as a factual one rather than becoming an opinionated statement. What about this? Poseidon is the strongest God in Olympus. Poseidon is the strongest God in Olympus. Al, is that an opinion or a fact? Hello, I hope the class heard that. Hello, Al. Hello, sir. There. The statement is, Poseidon is the strongest God in Olympus. Is that a fact or an opinion? Again, sorry. Opinion. Opinion, okay. What made you say that it is an opinion? Um there's it's not stated that it's stated that Zeus is the powerful one, more powerful one, sir. So Poseidon cannot be the strongest. Hey, Al has pointed out a backup to counter the statement about Zeus, no, about Poseidon being claimed as the strongest god in Olympus. That support provided by Al is in disagreement to the statement. Therefore, the statement Poseidon is the strongest god in Olympus can indeed be, be debated upon. It can be argued. The fact that it can be argued, it can be debated upon, proves that that statement is just an opinion, not a fact. So that's a clear-cut difference between a fact and a statement. And again, just because you see an adjective or any descriptive expression in a statement doesn't make that statement right away an opinion. Consider, do we have substantiary evidence? Do we have substantial evidence to establish the factuality of the statement? If there's none, it must have been an opinion. Do people still, can this be questioned? Do people question the statement? Is this statement generally acceptable? If it's not, it is an opinion. If it is generally and widely known and acceptable, then it is a fact. Statements like, the Philippines has been colonized. That's a fact. History records show this. The Filipinos were, uh, were subjugated. That, as, as, as opinionated as it may sound, that remains to be a fact. History provides that. Our records in history indeed show that at some point in our past, the Filipinos were subjugated, acclimated into someone else's culture. Now let's go into our mythological selection, the story of Daedalus and Icarus. The name Daedalus comes out to be quite a prominent one because through his name, there was a particular creation. In fact, this creation has even been used as one allusion in literature. The word labyrinthine comes from the word labyrinth. And in literature, the most famous labyrinth has been created by this skilled worker, the name of whom is 
Daedalus. Don't be surprised if you pronounce if some may pronounce it as Daedalus, it's fine. I just might pronounce, I just might shift from Daedalus, 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 Daedalus. But I'm referring to the same person, Daedalus. Again, he is known to be a very, very skilled worker. Famous architect, invert inventor, a master craftsman. These are descriptions of the kind of person that he is. As to when it led, why it led to the creation of the labyrinth, we'll go into that. Uh, I'll try to uh, I'll try to skip the two uh, some initial parts of the of the module. I'll go to some important parts, beginning with the name of Perdix. Who is Perdix? There are two accounts. There are several accounts to stand out. The talk of a nephew of Daedalus, with whom he has become envious of a skill. The first account talks of Perdix. Perdix is the nephew of Daedalus, and this nephew of him, of his, is one whose skills in the mechanical arts have indeed become so good to the point that Daedalus himself became jealous of Perdix. He, in fact, was the teacher of Perdix. Daedalus was the teacher of per teaching Perdix of the many skills that Perdix was able to master in the mechanical arts. However, Perdix became so good at it. Jealousy, the green-eyed monster, took over him, and then Daedalus became the cause of the death of Perdix himself. What did he do? Very simple. Daedalus then pushed Perdix from the top or from the hill of the Acropolis and Perdix was plunging unto his death. I mean, he was about to die not until, not until the goddess Athena turned Perdix into a partridge and that had saved him so um all that Daedalus did was supposedly to kill Perdix but Perdix did not die as the story says story says Perdix was rather saved by Athena I mean the Acropolis itself what uh, was hello read then Hello? What's the last thing that you heard? Let's start from that. Hello? Hello? Push. Ah, okay. In the first account, Perdix was pushed or tossed by Daedalus over the Acropolis at, while they were at the top of the hill of the Acropolis, but Perdix did not eventually die. Athena saw the incident and rather turned Perdix into a partridge, a bird, so he was saved. That's the first account. In another account, Perdix comes out as the sister of Daedalus. This is another version of a story. In another, in another version, Perdix is rather seen as the sister of Daedalus with whom, no, no, not with whom, that sounds differently, that sounds wrong. And Perdix had a son. The son of Perdix is Talos. Another nephew of, or a nephew of Daedalus. And it was this boy who got so good at the skill in the mechanical arts that Daedalus became jealous of. And it was supposedly him that was murdered by Daedalus by having him tossed from the Acropolis of Athens. So two accounts. First account, again, it was Perdix. 
in another account, Perdix, Perdix's name rather comes out as the sister of Daedalus, and it was Talos, the son of Perdix, who was tossed from the Acropolis of Athens. Regardless, what happened here is that there was really a, per, a person, an apprentice, who was tossed by Daedalus. He was killed by Daedalus. Because of this act of murder, Daedalus was tried. So he was subjected in the court of Areopagus. And then decision was made. The decision was made. He was punished with banishment. From Athens, he was banished and he fled to the island of Crete. The island of Crete was ruled by a king, the name of whom is King Minos the husband of Queen Pasiphae. I don't know. Hello, Graydon. Hello, Graydon. I'd like to ask once again, what's the last part that you heard from the story? What's the last thing that you heard? About hello, great then the murder. Um, have I mentioned the banishment? Have you heard the banishment? So, Daedalus was tried in the court of Ereopag at the court of Areopagus, and he was sentenced to banishment. So he fled Athens. No, he left Athens and fled to the island of Crete, where he worked for King Minos and Queen Pasiphae and their palace at Knossos, at the palace of Knossos. The name of King Minos, the names of King Minos and Queen Pasiphae stand out in mythology because of the Minotaur. Take note, the Minotaur is not the children of these two people. The Minotaur was rather born from Queen Pasiphae only. King Minos is not the father of the Minotaur. Though, it comes out as though Minos is the root word for Minotaur. But the, the two don't really have any connection at all. The name of Minos and the, the term Minotaur have no connection. That is not to make that, that is not to point out that uh, no, uh, the name of Minos is not the is not in any way associated to the Minotaur. King Minos is not the father of the Minotaur. How was the Minotaur or how did the Minotaur come into existence? There came, a, there came a time in the, life, in the lives of King Minos and Queen Daedalus that, their act, that his action as a king came to be an insult to the gods. The gods then, oh no, King Minos then prayed, for the, prayed to the gods and goddesses of Olympus to give him a sign, a sign on what he should do in order to appease those gods. Then the gods sent a white bull. Take note of that. The gods and the goddesses sent a white bull. When this white bull was sent to him, Poseidon wanted that white bull to be sacrificed to him. Because if you look at our, if you, if you go back to our lesson one in mythology, the bull is a significant animal to Poseidon. So he wanted the bull to be sacrificed to him. However, Minos said no. Why? Plain and simple. The bull, the white bull, seemed too fine to be sacrificed. I mean, it's one that is different from the other bulls around. He, see, he, see, he saw it as an animal that is just too perfect to be sacrificed. 
And that offended Poseidon. Poseidon saw it as an insult to him that a mortal denied a request of sacrifice or a demand of sacrifice that should be given to a god. So how did Poseidon punish King Minos? Rather, the punishment is not for King Minos. The punishment was extended unto Queen Pasiphae. What was the punishment all about? Queen Pasiphae was made to develop a kind of love, amorous longing for that white bull. In order to contain this, this amorous love that, the, that Queen Pasiphae had towards that white bull, King Minos instructed Daedalus to construct a wooden cow. That wooden cow is, in fact, if you look at it online, if you go for the picture of the wooden cow, that wooden cow could actually hold a person inside it. Like someone could stay inside that wooden cow. In, uh, in several versions of the story of Queen Pasiphae and King Minos, Queen Pasiphae could even be seen staying, placing herself inside that wooden cow. I don't know what she would do inside a wooden cow. I would not want to say anything much about it. Let's leave it up to Queen Pasiphae on what she did inside a wooden cow. And for some reasons, she became pregnant. It's not that the wooden, it's not that the white bull mated with Queen Pasiphae. The white bull was just represented now with a wooden cow. And Queen Pasiphae's amorous longing, desire for that white bull was expressed while she stayed inside that wooden cow. And again, she became pregnant. The child that she bore unto this world was then the Minotaur. So the Minotaur is a child of Queen Pasiphae and, safe to say, that wooden cow. And again, I do not know how she got pregnant. I would not want to try to imagine how things happen. Let's just leave it there. She became pregnant. And... The sight of a monster, a half man, a half full creation, was not one liked by Minos. So what did he do? He gave another set of instructions to Daedalus. He wanted him to construct a particular uh, construction that would trap the Minotaur inside it. And so came the famous labyrinth. The Minotaur was placed inside the labyrinth so that it could not find its way out. If there's one person who knows how to get out of that labyrinth, it's Daedalus himself. It was supposedly Daedalus. However, the issue lies now when, when King Minos sent his son Androgeus, it's not there. The name is E N D R O G E O S. Androgeus, I'll just place it in the chat box as well for others to see. Her. The name is e -N that's the name, Androgeus. The issue lies when. Minos sent his son, or the complication lies now, when King Minos sent his son Androgeus to Athens, to visit Athens. They go there from Crete. When Androgeus visited Athens, he was accidentally killed by the men of King Aegeus. I don't know if the name is there. The king... 
is named King Aegeus. So that's the, I sent in the chat box the name of the king. Athens at that time was ruled by him. And at that time, he also had a son. His son's name is Theseus. So Theseus was one hero, Athenian hero, who wanted to solve the issue behind the Minotaur. Why was there a complication when Idrius, when Androgeus died? When Androgeus died, the son of King Minos died. King Minos demanded that in exchange for the life of his son, there should be 14 young noble citizens to be sacrificed. Athenian citizens, take note, Athenian citizens to be sacrificed to the Minotaur. And when we say sacrifice, they are to be fed to the Minotaur. Who are these 14 noble Athenian citizens? They should be seven young men and seven maidens. For a while. Again, a sacrifice of seven young men and seven maidens was to be made as demanded by King Minos. Should King Minos decide to stop this, it would mean war. And King Idru, uh, not King Minos, sorry, should King Aegeus, Aegeus decide to stop the sacrifice the, the giving of sacrifices to the Minotaur, that would mean war. So for a long time, King Aegeus submitted himself to this demand, not until Theseus decided to stop it. So Theseus embarked on a journey and presented himself as one of those young men to be sacrificed to the Minotaur. Um, this, by the way, this act of, of sacrifice is not on a yearly basis. It does not have to happen every time. This sacrifice of 14 young men, uh, 14 young nobles from Athens happens on an interval of seven years. And that on every seven years, the sacrifice is to be made. There came a time that Theseus joined, and Theseus' plan was to eliminate the Minotaur. While in Athens, Theseus and King Aegeus had a pact, like had an, had an agreement. You will set sail from Aegeo, from Athens going to Crete. Should you decide, by the time you come back, and if you are successful in your adventure, in your journey, in your mission, you are to release and hang open a white sail. But if you end up unsuccessful in this journey, meaning you die, or if you don't manage to kill the Minotaur at all, your men are to raise a black sail. That is to signal while from afar, that is to inform King Aegeus that the mission was a failure, that perhaps it has led to the death of Theseus. So Theseus then embarked on the journey, set a sail towards the island of Crete. While there, while he, when he arrived at the island of Crete, the, uh, the, the great hero that he is, a great hero that he is, Theseus knew that on his own he won't make it. If he were to 
slay the Minotaur on his own. Like if he were to conquer the the Minotaur on his own, it would seem impossible. Plus, the labyrinth itself is a challenge. That's actually one of the reasons why many who have, many have died in that labyrinth. It's not just the Minotaur, but the labyrinth itself posing as a challenge. So plenty challenge, plenty of challenges met, met, met um, Theseus along the way. First is how should he how should he conquer the labyrinth? If he even if he manages to kill the Minotaur, how would he be able to get out of the labyrinth? Perhaps when it comes to strength, there won't be much of an issue. He probably has that. But conquering the labyrinth, that's an entirely different story. And so he was reminded, only one man could conquer his own structure, his own creation. And that's an architect, the architect himself. So he talked it out, he talked it out with Daedalus. Much so that the daughter of Minos and Pasiphae helped him. Ariadne, the princess of Crete, had fallen in love with Theseus and had helped him get the favor of Daedalus. True enough, Theseus got Daedalus' favor and Daedalus was, in, was able to help Theseus in giving him the idea on how to conquer the labyrinth. What was the idea? Daedalus told Theseus to have a string or a thread, a nice thin line of thread, tied at the door of the labyrinth as he would enter it. So that right after finding the Minotaur and slaying the Minotaur, all that Theseus has to do is to trace his way out of the labyrinth by still keeping hold of the thread. Cutting the story short, Minos was not, by the way, aware of this. The Minotaur was killed. The Minotaur was slain. And Theseus found his way out of the labyrinth. For sure, the news of this the news of the death of the Minotaur is not going to be liked by Minos. So right away, Theseus fled. Theseus left, escaped Crete together with Ariadne. Before we continue with the story of Daedalus, let's go to Theseus. So now Theseus is sailing his way back to Athens. On his way back, like uh, for several days, King Aegeus would stand by the cliff to look at the uh, to stand by a cliff where he had seen the ship of Theseus leave the shores of Athens. He would stand by that area. So many days he would stand by it, and no ship comes back until that time that he saw a ship, the ship where. Theseus, Ariadne, and his men were in making their way back to Athens. Here's the funny part. By some accident, I don't know what happened, Theseus raised the black sail. He must have forgotten the instructions or he must have gotten careless. So he raised the black sail. And what did that tell King Aegeus? When he saw the black sail from afar, what did he feel? What did he see? What did he, what did he think? His son failed. Or at worst, his son died. The sight of the black sail made King Aegeus feel so des uh, made King Aegeus feel despair. Feel a uh, uh, feel uh, what is this? Sorry. The sight of a black sail was a sight of despair for King Aegeus, and so he decided to jump off the cliff. With his son dead, he felt like, what's the point of living there? So he decided to jump off the cliff. The waters below the cliff were then named after him, now named the Aegean Sea. And so that's the origin, that's the legend that explains the Aegean Sea. Only to find out that Theseus was alive. 
By the way, I also mentioned last week, Medea is to be Medea's name is to be mentioned here in this story. Remember, Medea fled Corinth riding on a chariot drawn by dragons. So 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 posh riding on a uh, chariot drawn by dragons. She fled to Athens. And it was King Aegeus who welcomed her. Why was she welcome? King Aegeus was already of old age. And there was a possibility of sterility that he cannot anymore bear a child. Medea promised him to help him of his sterility issues. And in fact, it did work. For as long as King Aegeus would provide her a home. So King Aegeus welcomed the thought of it, welcomed Medea. They even had a son. The son's name is Medus. M-E-D-U-S. I'll put it in the chat box for a while. Medus. Medus is the name of the son of Medea and King Aegeus. Now that there's a son of Medea and Aegeus, Medea's thought is, there's a first, there, I have a male child to this king. I might as well let my child, my own son, have the chance of getting the rule of Athens. So what did Medea do? Once again, she used her charm and persuaded King Aegeus to poison his own son, Theseus. But this did not happen because his love as a father towards a son was stronger than the charm of Medea. Aegeus recognized that Theseus, the man, the boy in front of him, was his own firstborn, his own son. So he ended up not poisoning Theseus. But all the while, King Aegeus did not know that he was under the charm of Medea. So he did not have it charged against that the act was against Medea as well. Medea just realized that Medus won't have a chance cannot stand against Theseus in the rule or inheritance of Athens. That's Medea. Medea still, I, I don't know, Medea probably still had her hang-ups after what had happened to her and J, between her and Jason. She cannot just also go back to Colchis. Uh, you know what happened already. She, cannot, she was a traitor to Colchis, so she can't just also go back. Let's now go to... Minos, to King Minos, let's now go back to Crete. All of those happened in Athens. Let's now go back to Crete. King Minos realized Theseus would not have been able to conquer or kill the main Minotaur, would not have been able to leave the, the labyrinth if not for one man. Only one man again is known to be able to find an exit out of the labyrinth. So as Minos tried to rush, rationalize the problem, he thought of the name of Minos. Oh, no, he thought of the name of Daedalus. Daedalus should, have been, should be the only one that had helped this Athenian conquer the labyrinth. And Minos did not like it. Daedalus himself felt like Minos did not like what he just did. He feared for his own life as well as that for his own son. The son of Minos is Icarus. Uh, the name, by the way, is in the title. So they tried to devise a way to escape. Escaping from land seems impossible because the entire land of Crete is for Minos to rule. Escaping through the waters by sea is again another, almost another impossible matter because 
The eyes of Minos, the men of Minos, are there to watch over the seas, over the shores. So we only saw one possible way to escape, and that is through the air, by flying over the island of Crete. The issue there is that no mortal could fly. Only gods could do that. Only gods and goddesses have the ability of flight. Mortals cannot. But this did not stop the brilliant mind of Daedalus to come up with a way for him to be able to, to conquer the thought of flying, to be able to achieve the thought of flying. He devised now what we refer to as wings. How did he make these wings? He fashioned them with feathers held together with wax. There's one pair that he gave to him for himself, that he made for himself, another pair that he made one for his son. The thought of flying seemed impossible, not for the thought of flying for a mortal seemed impossible, not until Daedalus successfully created these wings, fashioned with feathers, held together with wax. So they were able to fly. But before taking off from the island of Crete, Daedalus gave two important instructions, three, three important instructions to Icarus. First one, always follow closely behind me. That's the first instruction that Daedalus told Icarus. Follow me, stay close to me. Second instruction, second reminder. Don't fly too close to the sun because that would melt the wax. Third instruction, don't fly too close to the sea because that would dampen the feathers, making it hard for you to fly. It would dampen the, the moisture coming from the seas, will dampen the feathers and making your flying difficult. Three simple instructions. But the youth in Icarus was overwhelming that he became very careless. His carelessness made him fly towards the sky, like higher and higher up into the sky. They were actually already crossing several islands. Your module says that they have crossed the islands of Samos, Delos, Leventhos. They're already moving far away from the island of Crete. As they were soaring in the air, this made Icarus feel all the more cocky. He became very cocky, very careless, very overconfident of the thought that they were flying. And he ended up soaring higher and higher up unto the sky, now becoming too close to the sun god Helios. And of course, the, I mean, the name itself denotes that there is heat emanating from this sun god. This sun god was in, in fact pulling the sun behind his chariot as his chariot was going over the sky. When this happened, like what Daedalus had already told Icarus beforehand, true enough, the wax on Icarus's feathers started to melt. As the wax started to melt, feather by feather, the wings had fallen off. Each feather fell off from the wings of Icarus. And all that Daedalus could do is watch. He could not anymore do anything about it. Eventually, um, despite the flapping of the arms that Icarus did, there's nothing that could be done about it anymore. Simply put, Icarus plunged onto the waters which led to his death. The waters where he fell and plunged unto his death has then been named after him, 
now known as the Ikarian Sea, where supposedly, according to some versions, Hercules, who was passing by, gave him a proper burial. So it was perhaps by some near co sheer coincidence, no? Her uh, Hercules was there on his adventure, and then he saw a body, he saw like a physical body falling from the sky and plunging to death in the waters. And so that water was named the Icarian Sea. For sure, this one is not to be to be rejoiced about. Daedalus grieved for the death of his son. Again, there's not there was nothing that he could do about it anymore. Should um if if Daedalus tried to help Icarus on on uh, on that matter when if he tried to grab him, who knows the weight of these two would not be. So it would, could not be carried by the feathers. If it could be, then one pair could have just been made and the two could have, fly, could have flown across the sea. Given that each of them has its own pair of wings, has its own pair of wings, that means that the pair was just good for one person. Daedalus wanting to escape the island of Crete was just really doing, his, doing what he could to also escape. He did not also fail on giving his son the reminders for him not to plunge into his own death. It was rather the carelessness, carelessness, and the cockiness of Icarus that seemed to be the cause of his own demise. Now, Daedalus had crossed over to the island of Sicily. A king named King Coccalus. Was, a, was the king of Camicos, Sicily. Coccalus welcomed him uh, to, knowing that he, not sorry, knowing, presenting himself as an architect, a master craftsman, Coccalus welcomed Daedalus in Camicos, Sicily. Uh, you'll find there the name of Camicos, C-A-M-I-C-U-S. That's the place where King Cocalus is, is a king. When Daedalus reached the island of Camicos, Daedalus built a temple for Apollo and hung up his wings there, presenting, the, presenting his wings as an offering to the said God. But vengeful as he is, King Minos is not yet done. Even if, even if, Daedalus had already reached the island of Sicily, the place of Sicily. Minos did not want the story to just end there. The news of having one great craftsman, inventor, reached the ears of Minos. News has reached him that a great inventor is now in the island of Sicily, in the place of Sicily. When this reached, when this was known by um, Minos, the first person that again he thought of was Daedalus. There was no other great inventor that he had known except for Daedalus. So he embarked on that journey. Minos himself went to Coccalus' court, went to Sicily to offer a reward to whosoever could thread a spiral seashell, one which is a seemingly impossible task. He presented this challenge so that he'd be able to let Daedalus reveal himself. And if, he, if Daedalus reveals himself, he could take him back and punish him. Among many, there were many who tried, but, and Daedalus bit on the, cha the challenge. It must have been as well because of his being a great man when it comes to the mechanical arts. He saw it not as one posed by Minos. He did not also know that it was Minos who posed the challenge, but he just saw it as a challenge that had triggered his being a craftsman. How did he conquer that challenge provided by Minos? 
The clever mind of Daedalus came to be at work. He tied a string to an ant. He placed the ant at one end of the shell and allowed the ant to walk through the spiral chambers until it came out from the other end. No other man in Sicily managed to conquer the challenge of Minos, but only it was Daedalus. Knowing that the challenge was conquered, Minos knew that Daedalus was this man who, who, who successfully conquered the challenge. When Minos then saw that it was, when, when Minos finally realized that it was Daedalus, King Cocalus then was, uh, no, King Minos, not King Cocalus. King Minos then made arrangements with King Cocalus that he take back Daedalus to Crete because of what Daedalus had done to uh, had done as a form of treachery to him. Again, the death of the Minotaur, conquering the labyrinth. Nino saw this as a form of betrayal to him, as Daedalus had helped Theseus. But King Cocalus, though there was an agreement, King Cocalus did not want to lose a skilled worker in his place, in his palace. So he tried to deceive King Minos. He promised, he promised that he would give Daedalus back to Minos, but on the idea that Minos should take a bath first and stay for some entertainment. Remember King Aetis? He welcomed the Argonauts gave them a bath first before granting them the chance to have the trials of courage. So same thing. King Cocalus seemingly agreed, but on the condition that Mino should take a bath first and stay for entertainment. Okay, there wasn't any problem that Mino saw about it. He agreed, only to find out that Minos was murdered by the daughters of Cocalus. Why was he murdered? Because Cocalus's daughters were pleased by the many toys and crafts and gifts made by Daedalus himself. Daedalus was a man of use in the court of Cocalus, King Cocalus. So the court of Cocalus would not want to lose Daedalus. Ironically, Daedalus left and then he went to Sardinia, led with a group led by Aeolus, a nephew of Hercules or Heracles. Heracles. So he eventually ended up leaving Camikos. He didn't also stay there. And that concludes the story of Daedalus and Icarus. Fortunately, we have ended the story, in fact, managed to end the story. It's also 8.35. On Thursday, let's see each other for the checking of FTs 1, 2, and 3. That will be all for this morning. Goodbye and thank you. Great day. Goodbye. Goodbye. And thank, Goodbye. You. Goodbye. And thank you. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye